Kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone to our web webinar for the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant. My name is Tessa Zant. I'm the Engagement Manager at Christchurch City Council. Thank you all for joining us online this evening. A bit of an agenda. First, I'll introduce the team behind the screen and let you know how you can participate during the session. I'll then hand over to our presenters who will run through our interim operations at the wastewater treatment plant, our progress so far removing the filter media, some of the environmental monitoring we're doing, and how we will continue to support the community. Oh, just next slide. Apologies about that. Uh, tonight you'll be hearing from the staff listed on your screen now. We will also have Karen and Sam working behind the scenes to keep the session moving smoothly. Uh, thank you for your questions that you have supplied during registration. Uh, we should answer those as part of the presentation. Your mics and cameras are switched off. This is so that we can keep the session moving, but there is an option to ask questions and receive answers using Slido. Change slide. So uh, this is done by going to our website slido.com. That's on your screen at the moment. On your browser or mobile device, um, you can enter it uh, and enter in the code 37466678. That's on your screen at the moment, the code. Or alternatively, you can scan the QR code that there is there on your mobile device. And that fast tracks you straight through to the Slido Q&A. Karen and Sam will be keeping an eye out for your questions, and these will be answered by staff at the end of the session. On Slido, you can also react, so you can give a thumbs up uh, to upvote the questions and answers in the um, chat section, and this tells us what questions matter more, and we can focus more on these and prioritise them. If we, for any reason, can't answer uh, some questions tonight, we will take them away and provide answers via email. This will be sent back to you around two days after this webinar. If you are hard of hearing or if you are experiencing sound issues, you can turn on live captions. Just click on the three small dots across the top of your screen by more um, and click turn on live captions, which is near the bottom of the drop down list. One last thing from me, hopefully the banner came up at the beginning of this session to let you know that this is being recorded. This recording will be shared on our YouTube channel in the next few days. You'll receive a link via email showing you how to access this recording along with a copy of the PowerPoint slides and any questions that we weren't able to answer for you tonight. I'll now hand over to Jane Davies to start off the presentation. Thanks, Tessa. Um, I assume that you can see me. Um, look, welcome everyone. Um, just, I want to, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any elected members here, but if there are, um, I welcome them. Um, now, I also want to just acknowledge that there's media um, in the room. So the media are with us, um, as they have been for our previous um, public meetings. So this is the fourth of um, a group of four public meetings that we've had over the last um, couple of weeks. Um, welcome to the residents who are living near our oxidation ponds and wastewater treatment plant. Before, um, before we start, on, on behalf of the team, I just want to acknowledge that for um, many of you, um, living near the ponds has been pretty awful in the last few weeks and living near the wastewater treatment plant since our fire last November has at times been um, a pretty revolting experience. I do acknowledge that, we all acknowledge that and I want to assure you that we are doing everything we can as quickly as we can um, to make it right and to stop the odour. Now I appreciate that um, it may not look like we're working really fast but I assure you that we are and so part of the, the um, presentation tonight will be telling you what we've been doing um, and what we've got coming up. We're almost there um, in terms of getting rid of the really offensive odour. So there's a few key messages that we just want to um, emphasise um, through our presentation tonight. Um, one, um, one of the messages is just around the odour. Um, we are monitoring the odour. Um, we have been doing that for a few weeks now and we're working with specialists in that area. Um, what we're finding is the, um, the odour or the, the, the uh, 
discharges that we're measuring, the hydrogen sulfide, which um, Nigel will talk to you in a bit more detail about, um, is at elevated levels, but not at levels that are causing health impacts. So we, while we acknowledge that a number of people are, are having a lot of symptoms, headaches, nausea, and so on, and that is pretty uncomfortable for people, we acknowledge that. Um, what our health um, advisors have told us is that there will not be any long-term health effects, or very unlikely to be long-term health effects from the exposure. We will continue to monitor uh, and, and publish the results of that monitoring. Um, the oxidation ponds are the primary source of the odour at the moment. Um, we're not getting odour off the trickling filters as we did um, for a period um, earlier in the year. It is the um, oxidation ponds. Um, Helen will talk you through what we're doing to fix that. And as I said, um, we're on the homeward leg now with fixing the oxidation ponds and therefore getting rid of the odour. The trickling filter media is just about finished in terms of the removal um, and we've, we're now just waiting for some results from the paint discoloration on some of the houses in the area um, and those, um, those results and the report will be received by us next week, we're expecting, um, and we'll publish that as quickly as we can. So those are the key messages. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Helen, who's going to just talk you through what we're doing at the wastewater treatment plant to fix um, or replace the work of the trickling filters um, and, to, and obviously to get rid of the odour. Helen. Thanks very much. And if we could um, move on to the next slide, please. So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of what happened at the treatment plant before the fire. And what we're showing you on the screen here is a mix of the physical and biological treatment steps that the wastewater went through before being discharged out the long outfall offshore. And what we have is um, is through the steps of the process, we're separating cleaner wastewater off from the solid material and adding oxygen as much as we can through that process. So we start out with it with the terminal pump stations that brings the wastewater through the screens, takes out large materials such as rags and anything that people have dropped in there like uh, false teeth. Then we have grit removal, so it takes out any sand and grit that gets entrained in the sewage through the system. And then onto the sedimentation tanks. And the sedimentation tanks are where most of the solid material is dropped out from the wastewater. That solid material goes off to the digesters and then the cleaner wastewater used to go on to the trickling filters. Now the trickling filters were the heart of our biological treatment and they took out approximately 60% of the organic load of the wastewater. So the loss of those has been catastrophic. Now following the trickling filters, the wastewater moved on to the aeration tanks. We added more oxygen there. Then to the clarifiers, again that step of clean wastewater off the top and a solid material dropping off the bottom and going back to the digesters and then finally out to the oxidation ponds. And in the past um, two or three decades, those oxidation ponds have just been polishing ponds. They haven't worked as working oxidation ponds because the water going into them is very, very good quality. Now, just before we move to the next slide, I just wanted to say that immediately following the fire, because we lost those trickling filters, we moved the next day to improving the processes that we had remaining. So we added polymer to those primary sedimentation tanks to increase more uh, to increase the removal of solids and try and reduce that organics load through the plant. We also doubled the aeration in those aeration tanks to get more oxygen into that wastewater. And we put in place uh, hydrogen peroxide dosing. So hydrogen peroxide, well, it sounds uh, a nasty chemical. It breaks down into oxygen and water. And so we added that to the oxidation ponds. And if we could move to the next slide, please. So I've talked a little bit about the response immediately following the fire and we, we put in place those additional responses to the remnants of the plant over four to eight weeks following the fire. So all of that was in place by, by Christmas time. And then um, at the same time, we had our planning teams and our senior operational engineers working with consultants to look at what we could do in the interim. So before we rebuilt the trickling filters process, what kit could we repurpose on the wastewater treatment plant 
and quickly get a biological treatment process back into place. And in December, the recommendation was to convert two of our four clarifiers into aeration basins, which would support an activated sludge process. And that activated sludge process would replicate uh, what was previously done by the trickling filters. Not as good a capacity or effectiveness, but would do the biological treatment, most of that biological treatment for us. So over, um, over the last six months, we've been um, putting in place all of the kit for this, converting those two clarifiers, uh, making sure the remaining two clarifiers are in good condition so that they, they can work for us over the next few months, and then putting in place the bypass pipe work so that we could bring, bring the effluent uh, past those trickling filters and into the aeration basins and then across to the clarifiers. As well, we've kept in place um, the odour control that we retrofitted to our grit removal uh, as the original stuff was damaged by the fire. We've kept in place the polymer dosing in case we need it to uh, improve that solids removal in the sedimentation tank. And we've kept in place the hydrogen peroxide dosing as a backup. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, So this is the bypass pipe, and you can see the trickling filters in the background. So these um, bypass pipes, the photograph on the left shows the primary pump station at the back. So that's taking the wastewater from that pump station past the trickling filters and then uh, down to the new aeration basins. If we move to the next one, this is an early shot of those aeration basins in operation. So the aerators are now in place within those clarifiers. Previously, those clarifiers, you would have seen still clear water. Um, now we're putting in a, a higher load of organics and solid matter, and the aerators are running. And what we were doing here was building that biomass. Uh, we've since disestablished all of these pumps and the temporary generators and the permanent pumps have been installed. And if we move to the next one. So this is an aerial view of those aerators and you can see all of the pipe work between um, those aeration basins has now all been completed and connected up. So these, um, these aeration basins will do the same job that the trickling filters did and remove the organic load and that will improve the wastewater going out to the ponds. And as that improved wastewater passes through the ponds, so we've got six ponds in, in series, the water quality in those ponds will improve, first in pond one and then moving all the way through to pond six, uh, and that will uh, eliminate the source of the hydrogen sulfide odours. So with the we're commissioning this week, and what commissioning means is that we've got all of the kit in place, all of the pipe work connected up, all of the power to the site where it needs to be. And now we're going through and checking each piece of equipment, making sure that it's operating as it ought to, and then operating the system as a whole and evaluating the treatment of that wastewater. So that'll take place over, over the next few days. And if we need to make, make any changes or modifications, we'll take that piece of equipment offline, make the modifications, and then um, put it back into the process. So that process takes three to six weeks, and then the flushing of the ponds will take um, three to six weeks, depending on the weather. So the most likely scenario here is that around eight weeks, we should have flushed all of the poor quality water through those ponds uh, and eliminated the major source of the odours. So moving on to the next one, thank you. So just a note about the oxidation ponds themselves. Now the oxidation ponds performed very well through the summer, despite those high organic loads. So they, um, they worked well for us through December, January, February. Uh, March, they were still okay, but come April, they started to deteriorate and then deteriorated very rapidly as the cooler winter weather came. And we also had much less wind, so we didn't get that uh, mechanical agitation at the surface. So the ponds um, have, have indeed um, lost the dissolved oxygen that they used to have on the surface, and that's allowed the hydrogen sulfide to form and then um, disperse across the community depending on the wind, and Nigel will 
talk a little bit about that. The other thing is that the discharge through the outfall now has much higher loads of uh, suspended solids, organic matter and bacteria. Uh, and whenever those results exceed the standard values in our consent, we notify Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health. Uh, and we also do follow up samples. The other thing we're doing, because we know that the wastewater going out the outfall is not as good as we like it to be, we've doubled our sampling on the beach. So we sample along the beach at three places, at the uh, surf club on uh, New Brighton Beach, then further down the spit and then over at Sumner. And we're pleased to see that the results are within the standard values at the beach. So we're not getting that um, poor quality wastewater affecting the water right on the coast. Thank you. The next one. Thanks, Alan. Evening, everyone. Um, quick update on uh, the removal process for the media within the trickling filters. Um, two weeks ago, the first structure was um, completely emptied, so that was uh, completed six weeks ahead of schedule. Um, so our contractors are making uh, fantastic progress with the removal. Um, removal of material from the second structure that started last week, um, that started on schedule. Initially, um, it was anticipated that the first and second structure removal would overlap, so they would start on the first one, start removing it, build the ramp for the second and start removing media from the second and the two would be over, that removal period would overlap. Um, but as, as luck has it, they uh, our contractors were moving with quite, quite some speed um, and they completed the removal of the first um, um, media within the first structure um, at about the same time they were finish, finishing uh, the first, uh, the second ramp. So um, there is no crossover anymore. So. The removal for uh, tank two, uh, structure two, started on schedule, um, but we're anticipating that um, if all goes to plan um, and runs as smoothly as removal of the first structure, um, we'll be completing removal of that media well ahead of our, um, our predicted 7th of September date. Um, as uh, seeing is believing, uh, next slide please. Uh, this was an image that was captured about noon today. So on the right hand side there, you can see the, um, the first uh, structure um, completely emptied of material now and the uh, steel rotating arms at the top have gone um, and so has the floating floor. Um, uh, and it's just the concrete uh, slab at the uh, bottom that remains now. Um, that looks like it was an, um, undamaged and in good condition, so that will remain. Um, and on the left hand side of that image, you can see you know, if you squint or zoom in a bit, um, there is a 20 ton digger down in the bottom um, of that second structure, um, uh, scooping the material towards the uh, larger 80 ton digger that's sitting at, on the top of that ramp between the two uh, structures. Um, so they're making um, some very good progress. Uh, next slide. I think that's me. Hi, Nigel Grant here. The, yeah, just to uh, follow on from Helen and Michael, so environmental monitoring. We're uh, most people will know now. We we started off doing six rounds of just grab samples once a week for quite a wide range of um, compounds, and they. They identified two two compounds in particular which are of interest to us. Um, one was methyl mercaptan, which can be detected at very low levels. It's very odorous, um, and these this and obviously is a contributor to the smell. The um, the second one is um, sulfur was the which you've heard Helen refer to uh, hydrogen sulfide, and it it it's been shown. So we've chosen that. It's a good indicator gas for the area affected. Um, it's been consistently emitted from the ponds and it's and we can monitor it and uh, and it, it can be you know, it's able to be detected by the monitors that we've um, chosen. It has been detected at levels which can cause annoyance and symptoms such as nausea, headache, eye nose irritation. And the, so to continue on with that work, we've had three continuous monitors in place now for uh, over three weeks, it's Bromley School and two residential locations near Rudds Road and over in uh, South Brighton Marine Parade. And we uh, we now have uh, six further monitors that we've uh, we're in the process of we have them and we're in the process of deploying them. And uh, 
that we just kind of place those around the ponds and they'll give us a much better continue to give us a improving picture of um, how things are going and you can see there they're, they're 4G so we can um, track them without having people to visit them so we can keep a closer eye on them as well so uh, next slide yeah so this this slide here you can see that that's where the number of samples where we were taking the grab samples we had a um, air quality specialist assisting us with those we started off uh, close to the works and at some some residential locations and as as the weeks went by uh, that air quality specialist they they were very interested in um, following both where the odor was going on the chosen days that we were sampling and obviously the wind direction so they ended up um, covering quite a wide range of areas uh, so next slide Okay, so this this map here, this this is showing you. Um, you can see the red dots. That that's where we're in, pretty much intending to place the uh, uh, permanent the the monitors for measuring 4G that will feed back to us. And we also have a couple of extra monitors that we will place uh, from day by day or week by week, depending on wind direction or other things that we wish to investigate. And you can see there on the uh, bottom bottom right hand corner is a, a wind rose which shows just at the moment uh, between June and September it's historical data the way the wind goes so we're experiencing wind from from a pretty much a westerly direction rather than northwest which um, blows across to South Brighton and equally um, a wind which is um, more more of a uh, yeah once again more east rather than north which uh, blows blows across so that that's obviously where we've um, we've put our monitors at the moment. So, uh, next slide. Okay, this is a picture of um, of of what the monitor looks like. It's not it's not sitting there. It's just been taken for a for a shot and a, um, a shot of the ponds on a pretty good day. The meter. Um, does give us data that looks like, as you can see there on the left, bottom left, um, a lot of a whole lot of dots, which it's recording a three minute sample every every ten minutes, and then also the red line is gives you an hourly average, and above that, just as confused as a um, a graph of the wind, which does match that nicely. It's important; both of those are important to us, um, so that we can, and they do obviously correspond with um, the wind. The wind strength and the direction also suggests where um, the odour is going to be at that time. And in this particular example, um, you can see the uh, yellow stripe up there shows that there's an increased sulphur dioxide being measured at that site at the same time as as we've had the wind uh, coming in. Uh, that's that's from a, where are we there? That's yeah coming in from an easterly direction. So uh, next slide. And this is what um, anybody who's had a look on our website recently will see. We've, we've, with the three monitors that we've had in place for some time now, we've just started putting up the data on a, on a weekly basis. It's an hourly average, so uh, you can you can see there at um, yeah this this one's for Rudd's Road. So we've had the wind blowing across across towards Rudd's Road, and at times, as Jane said earlier, it has it has exceeded to a small more level above above the um, guideline that we have we're using our air specialist has advised us to use and alternately at other times you can see other days winds been blowing in the other direction so um, the at to other times those those properties aren't aren't being exposed to the uh, to the gases coming off the pond so next slide thanks okay so the um so yeah the, what we, we're measuring hydrogen sulfide there's a range of standards there's not a one particular New Zealand one that sets a specific um, environment uh, well a, a health a health standard but it, it yeah so you can see there it's noted noted for uh, strong and offensive odor even at low concentrations the odor detection level is is, is wide it's um, you know it can be detected at 
right down to um, yeah, 0 0.0003 parts per million up up to um, 0 0.016, and it decreases the ability to um, smell. It also decreases with age as well as just per people's um, personal response to it. Um, and the concentrations, as I said earlier, they um, above the odour threshold, they can lead to annoying and discomforting symptoms such as headaches and nausea. Um, the Ministry of Environment does have an ambient one hour guideline of 0 0.005 ppm. That's to avoid odour nuisance rather than health, specific health effects. Uh, and we're using a, a standard from a, a international standard from California, California Office of Environmental Health Assessment. Uh, exposure level of point per hour is 0 0.03 ppm, and that's to avoid nuisance, annoyance, nuisance, and headache and nausea. We've certainly been discussing that with our uh, colleagues in public health unit, and they they're in agreement with that. The that that level it can be detected by 83% of people at at that level, and will be discomforting. Can't will cause discomfort to 40% of people at that level. Um, we also we acknowledge is that WorkSafe does have a um, guideline for standards as well. They're much higher, uh, five ppm. They're based on um, they're obviously based on people being exposed, uh, healthy adults being exposed for an eight-hour period, and then not being exposed for the rest of the day. So we're not saying that applies to residents. We're using obviously a much lower level. So next slide, thanks. OK, so just to continue on really quickly, um, you say, as, as I said, we meet uh, regularly with Medical Officer of Health and Environment Canterbury. That's happening on a weekly basis. Now, in regards to the paint staining, um, we've we've had obviously had a number of um, calls about that and have kept details of people who have been call, calling us. The initial concern was it may have been a, some type of mould. People were concerned well, with the, uh, their um, breathing it in. So we have had testing done on that. The, there was mould species identified on uh, on the houses that we tested, and they um, they would they, but they were just found to be uh, common mould species that would be expected over any house in New Zealand and at levels that was the uh, people doing the testing for us said was 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 extremely normal. So we've discounted mould as being a cause of that discoloration. So we're we're also having now the same environmental firm. They've carried out further testing um, to to look at what our, what else is causing that discoloration, and they've they've done that work, and we're expecting a report on that. Uh, yeah, on that we next week is when we we're wanting that. They're do, they're doing a thorough write up on it. I noticed um, somebody's raised a question: Are they? You know, is how's that connected with council? Well, they're they're a private environmental firm, certainly not um, connected to uh, council's insurer. In any way, so, um, and so the the last one really quickly is that we were concerned about the potential of the chipper causing the, for the um, plastics coming out of the with the media causing noise along Shorten Street boundary. But um, we did some work around that, and we did and we had some modelling done prior to uh, that 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 taking place at, at both sites. And yeah, we they gave us the confidence, and I. Pretty sure we've experienced that that the noise wasn't going to be at the sort of level that cause at, cause further disturbance. So, thanks very much. And the next slide will lead to the next speaker. Um, Kira, thanks, Nigel. Um, so, um, unfortunately, um, health can't be with us um, at this meeting tonight. Um, they were planning to come, but they've got um, other priorities that unfortunately came up. So I'm just going to report what um, Health New Zealand, formerly the DHB, um, and Public Health have told us. Um, so we've known for a long time that there's concerns in the um, community around um, the health effects, particularly of the hydrogen sulphide or the odour, um, and the health um, people that we've been working with, and as Nigel said, we're meeting with them on a weekly basis, um, they also acknowledge that. Um, so they have done a lot of research themselves, um, and they have advised us that um, while there are 
definitely people suffering um, and there is definitely um, both mental health issues and physical symptoms. Um, they're not seeing um, major health issues in the community in terms of any issues that are going to be um, long-standing or um, continuing post the odour being generated. Um, they, we did ask them to set up a, a health register um, and that was on the basis of feedback that we were getting from the community and I'll, I'll go into that one in a minute um, and give you their response to that. Um, they, um, their advice to us and their advice to the community that anybody that's having health issues that they believe are associated with the odour or any other health issues, um, the best option for everybody is to go and see their doctor or other medical professional. Um, next slide. Um, so the sort of things that they are hearing from the conversations I've had with um, GPs and um, other um, agencies in the um, Bromley and, and wider Eastern communities um, is that n very few people are presenting to GPs um, for health effects directly associated with the odour as the primary reason for their visit to the doctor. So a number of people are though going to the doctor and then reporting um, the symptoms that they're experiencing um, because of the odour. Um, they know that there are a lot of people that are being negatively affected um, in terms of mental wellness. Um, so there is a lot of distress and frustration in the community and a lot of se and a sense of powerlessness. And, um, so, and we acknowledge that as well as the council. So they, as I said, they do advise people if, if people are really suffering, particularly if it's, if it's a mental health issue, to go and see their doctor or other medical professional. So the sort of symptoms that they're hearing about, that we're, we're hearing about generally as well, nausea, headaches, eye and throat irritation, skin irritation, worsening of asthma if people are susceptible to asthma, and sleep disturbance. And now those symptoms are very consistent with the international um, information around um, hydrogen sulphide. So the medical people are saying they're not, they're not surprised by the symptoms that people are presenting with or are talking about. Next slide. Okay, so just in terms of the health register, so the um, so the um, medical officer of health did seriously look at the um, health register option. They have said that they will not be setting up a health register. Now the reasons that they have given, um, it wouldn't tell us the true extent of people exposed. So health registers, um, are, and in, particularly in circumstances like this, will be um, will have serious underreporting. Um, they also say that they don't need to have a register to know that people throughout the community are, who are exposed to the odour from the wastewater treatment plant and the oxidation pond are suffering um, physical health issues and mental health issues. Um, they're saying it is quite um, complex to set up and maintain a health register. Um, and if a health register was to be established, it would have to be maintained for quite a number of years because one of the purposes of a health register is not just to register the people who are suffering symptoms but to monitor those people over time. They're saying that the best way to do that is for people to tell their doctors about the symptoms that they are experiencing and it will be the doctors who monitor those people over time. In effect, in effect um, the GPs holding the information about individuals are, are a health register. So while public health doesn't have access to individual health records, they do have access to general information um, out of the primary um, medical um, centres um, and they can monitor what's happening on a community um, level. So there won't be a health register established. Uh, next slide. Um, so I guess just in summary, the, um, there is evidence from a number of sources um, and including people self-reporting um, and people sharing their experience through um, Facebook and other social media that, that, that people are exposed to odour and it's sulphur dioxide and it is causing problems. The um, Medical Officer of Health has been really clear to us that she is confident that once the odour disappears, then the um, symptoms for people will disappear. 
although we all acknowledge that for a number of people, the mental wellbeing issues that have been generated because of people needing, having to live with this odour for an extended period of time will persist beyond the odour disappearing. But from a physical wellbeing point of view, um, the Medical Officer of Health has told us that it's very, very unlikely that there will be any long-term health effects, physical health effects from the exposure. Next slide. Um, so that's a nice little segue into um, the community support and social recovery plan, which I will now hand over to Gary to talk to you about. Hi everybody, Gary Watson here. Uh, so as you can see on the slide, I'm not going to read off it because I'm sure you're all able to read it, but we've had the four community providers um, delivering the package. Um, 2,340 in zone grants, approximately, uh, well it is 468,000. Um, so that's 66% that's of the in zone applicants have applied and have been obviously successful. Um, however, it has really slowed um, and I think talking to the uh, providers uh, earlier this week, we're down to one or two coming in. So um, yeah, I need to have a look at that figure and, and to see where we go with that. Uh, 215 out of zone grants have been made. So that's about 62% of people who have it applied. Um, and that's been from reasonably um, all around, I guess, the zone. Um, however, um, South Brighton and New Brighton, um, we now that the winds have changed, we've reassessed and we're picking up a lot more over there and um, um, assessing those. So um, uh, at the start, um, we weren't really considering that because of the way we chose the zone, uh, the amount of, or the, I guess the regularity of the wind was driving the smell somewhere else. Not saying that it wasn't affecting everybody because it absolutely was. So um, I um, acknowledge that totally. Um, we've held uh, actually four, because we've done the fourth one today, joint meetings with the council. Uh, I should change that, it's not the CDHB anymore, it's Health New Zealand. Pegasus Health, um, MSD and the Ministry of Education. So we're trying to work together um, any anything that happens in the zone, um, affects all of our partners, so uh, trying to work together on this. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, and actually, um, I do have a question that's come through, um, and it was basically, does the council feel that the $200 um, that was being given is, is fair uh, for the duress that people are going through? And I have to say personally for me, um, uh, the $200 um, was set from a budgetary side. Um, I, I, I don't know how to put a value on the impact that this has had on people. I'm, it is probably more than the $200. I'll acknowledge that it's been pain for a lot of people. But in terms of the $200, we have had a lot of people come in and be thankful for it and um, you know have, have used it to cover those things that they needed. So um, I don't really know how I can say it is or not. Anyway, uh, support for schools and early child learning centres. So we met with principals and managers of um, ECEs uh, early on in the picture. Um, the, the Ministry of Education has gone through and put air purifiers in all of these schools and those ones that had them already have put extras in uh, and the early learning centres um, have had air purifiers added as well. From a council viewpoint, we've made a grant to the schools and the early learning centres, um, really unrestricting what they spend it on because they know their kids and their environment better than we do. Um, and um, one of the principals had said through the earthquake, uh, they took children away to other parts of the city and really that, although it was nice to get out for a day, um, took them away from home and took them away from their safe zone. So schools and principals are making those decisions. Um, as you can see, seven schools and 19 are there. Um, the discussion around um, any zone change um, will be at council on the 28th of July, but obviously any zone change that happens will include schools and ECEs as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you. Akiyota Koto, Simon Maka here, um, Senior Communications Advisor here at the Council. <clears throat> Just get, want to give you a bit of a, um, a comms update uh, on how, how it's all tracking. Um, so we've got a rolling blog on our Newsline channel, um, which is the Council's um, news and media uh, website. Um, so we're updating that two to three times a day. Um, at the moment, so that can be anything from you know just daily wind forecast for the coming day. Um, it can be latest testing results that come up. You know, drone footage. Say from today, we had two new drone images that you've seen in this presentation, um, and they were put on there as well. We're also updating the website two to three times a week, and as part of that, um, we've actually done a bit of a redesign of the website um, this week. So like yesterday and today, <coughs> so we've actually um, instead of just having one web page now, it's actually like a landing page, and you can click through to different pages. So it's a lot more user friendly and especially because there's going to be a lot more information with all the um, air testing uh, results and stuff st starting to come onto those sites and becoming online you know, every every week or so. Um, we just wanted to make it really user friendly and so people can get access to the information that they need to without scrolling for days. Uh, so we'll continue to respond to questions and updates um, both about community support and on the on-site works. This is through social media and, and media um, questions that we get. Um, we've got a video that we've put up online on the website. <clears throat> um, so that was more around how we've, um, I guess, how, how we've modified the plant um, to to address, you know, what's happened as a result of the fires um, and the different measures that we've put in place. And we've also got another another video in the pipeline at the moment um, that's going to talk more about a bit more to those diagrams that were shown earlier on in this presentation about um, how the plant operated initially and how it's now operating as a result of the fire. Uh, we put out a weekly e-newsletter, um, so that goes to a database of about 550 people at the moment. Uh, and there's a hard copy version of that as well, and that's at their uh, community providers. Um, <clears throat> the hard copy version of that newsletter is also made into an A2 poster, and we've got that on information panels um, that are at the community providers and at Eastgate Mall as well. Thank you. So just to um, round up two more slides. Um, so coming up in the next little while, um, we've got obviously, as Helen pointed out, the interim treatments pollution is nearing complete completion. Um, it will be fully operational within the next two weeks. We're expecting it to be a bit quicker than that. Um, and that will lead to the progressive improvement of the oxidation ponds. Now what we're going to do is we're going to measure the, the improvement in the oxidation ponds um, over the next few weeks and we will be reporting that um, through Simon's communication channels. So people will be able to see um, and track the progress of the oxidation pond improvement. Um, at this stage we're on track to um, have the um, oxidation ponds um, back to where they need to be um, in September. So what will coincide with the oxidation ponds recovering, obviously, is the odour um, reducing significantly. Um, and, and so um, September is the date that we're aiming for there. Um, we will um, conclude the investigation of the paint discoloration um, and we'll be um, printing or publishing that report next week. What we're also going to do um, alongside that is, um, depending on what the nature of the, uh, the findings are, we will be um, providing homeowners um, helpful tips or guidance on what to do in response to um, the discoloration. So that will all come out next week is the plan. Um, and then as um, Gary talked about, we will be reporting to the next council meeting, which is on the 28th of July, um, and it's likely to include a recommendation around the um, support package and extending that support package. Final slide. So just going back to a summary, I guess, of what we've said tonight, um, we are doing the air monitoring. Um, we are confident that what we are seeing um, in terms of the levels of hydrogen sulphide that are being um, discharged or um, discharged into the air and the people are um, living with um, are quite um, clearly causing some health issues, um, but, no, but they're not exceeding in the um, international standards that would cause significant concern around people's health. Um, the oxidation ponds are the primary source of the odour at the moment. We're on track to um, address that and within an eight-week period we believe that the oxidation ponds will have recovered. 
Uh, the trickling filter media is um, ahead of schedule, well ahead of schedule, um, and that will finish in the next very short while. And as I said, we'll be releasing the paint discoloration report next week with some um, guidance to homeowners on what it will mean for them. So that is the end of our, um, our pr presentation, and I think we go now to questions. Yep, thanks Jane and thanks to all of the speakers this evening. Hopefully everyone found that quite helpful. We have had some questions coming in. Thank you for sending those through. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Nigel first. So you answered the question around um, that the paint testing is being done by an independent organisation. We've had a bit of a follow up question to that. Um, given the extent and similarity of the paint damage recorded, does Council consider on balance of probabilities there is a link between this um, and the plant? I'll just cut to Nigel and you can answer that one for us. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tessa. Yes, certainly we've seen, um, as I talked about earlier, that we've seen the discoloration on both sides of the treatment plant. That's the only area of Christchurch that it's happening, and we're carrying out the work um, just just to see what the cause is. So, it, yeah, we yeah we're we're certainly um, looking at looking at it as if it may well have been caused by something coming off the pond. So that. That, that's the answer to that question. Thanks, Nigel. Did you see the other question there at the top as well? Um, hopefully you are the right person to answer this. Uh, How can you quantify um, oh, yeah. what the odour will be? Yeah, once the interim solution is fully operational, if the odour persists, will Council expedite a permanent solution? Yeah, so how can we quantify um, what's what's happening after when the interim solution has is is in place? Is we're going to continue that monitoring, um, you know, for for as long as it takes, basically more more than a year or two. Those council has bought those monitors. They're going to continue with that as as work continues on that um, treatment plant for quite some time. And um, so the we yeah, we're expecting the and there's another question about that further down also referring to um, the environment ministry for environment level of um, 0. 0.0005 as well so we we can't say there won't there won't be odors from time to time off off the pond as the as as time goes by we're expecting the interim work to to make a bigger as has been talked about make a big impact um, but from time to time there may well be still um, levels coming off that pond we would not like to think that they're going to go higher than that um, the uh, california office standard of 0 0.003 but as i say we'll we'll be continuing to monitor those on it just yeah on a um, basically a, a daily basis and comparing those notes also to the um, this was talked about earlier that the health of the ponds that they can also test through the um, dissolved oxygen and oxygen demand levels as well. So to try and pull it into a whole package. I hope that's um, answered it. Helen may want to also make a comment. Yeah, uh, that we've got a few questions there for Helen as well. Thanks, Nigel. That's that's really useful. Um, Helen, if you do have any more to add that to that as well as the the questions that you've got, you can see there as well. Yeah, so the the question is around will the will the levels be below that um, 0 0.005 ppm Ministry for the Environment guideline level? And yes, we do expect that the interim treatment will reduce it below those levels. Um, however, as Nigel has pointed out, the the interim treatment pro process is not as effective, nor is it as robust as our um, fully operational treatment plant. And so if we get equipment failures, it's possible that we will have to send uh, wastewater with a higher uh, organics load to the ponds again. And depending for how long that sort of equipment failure and outage lasts depends on whether or not the ponds will suffer. Um, and it's also a little bit dependent on the time of year. If it's during the summer, uh, we can manage those outages uh, pretty well and the ponds will recover very quickly. Uh, but if it's during the winter and it's for a period of more than a few days, then we may get um, some odours coming off the ponds. We do have um, some backup plans though. We um, 
we have borrowed some mechanical aerators and those are being refurbished to go into Pond 1. So that'll add oxygen to Pond 1. And we're looking at purchasing some of our own um, mechanical aerators. We're also going to keep the hydrogen peroxide dosing facility in place so that we can add oxygen directly to the wastewater being discharged to the ponds. Uh, and we're also trialling other chemical dosing um, possibilities. So those are options that where the chemical will interfere with the production of hydrogen sulfide. So they won't um, they won't add oxygen or improve the wastewater itself, but they'll interfere with the production of hydrogen sulfide so that we don't get those foul odours. So um, yes, we think it'll improve. There is a chance if we get equipment failures that um, we could get some reoccurrence, uh, but we've got uh, two or three other things that we can do to uh, improve the process. And uh, yes, I agree. Uh, also, we will be continuing that hydrogen sulfide monitoring. We'll monitor dissolved oxygen in the ponds and we'll also monitor the, the biological load. Uh, so that biological oxygen demand load in the um, in the water going into the clarifiers. So right back through the process, we'll check uh, how well we're doing. Now there was another question too about whether or not we discharged raw sewage into the ponds directly after the fire and the answer to that is no. We Our physical treatment processes remained intact. So we had our screening, our grit tanks and our primary sedimentation tanks that were still working and treating the wastewater coming into the plant. Uh, and in fact we enhanced the operation of those primary sedimentation tanks the day after the fire. So we had our polymer dosing unit in place the day after the fire to improve that um, primary treatment. Uh, and the other thing we did um, is we we usually operate with four of our primary sedimentation tanks running, uh, but we've brought the other two online. So we're now using all six to absolutely maximise that um, physical treatment process and that, that solids removal. That's me. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, we have got a few more questions. Um, Jane, I think you're uh, down to answer these. Um, does the contractor have public liability insurance which covers uh, discoloration of up to homes or does the council have public liability insurance which will cover it? Thanks, Jane. Um, so I can't speak for the contractor, but yes, the council does have public liability insurance. Um, but what I would say is that um, we need to wait to see what the results of this investigation is um, on, on the cause of the discoloration and the nature of the discoloration. I think before we start talking too much about um, bringing in insurance and the, the liability or public liability. Um, I'm hopeful that actually what, what we will find is um, not something that's going to sort of generate a whole lot of claims. Um, I mean, I guess you'd say I would say that because I'm the council, but um, you know, I, I think that um, we, let's just wait and see till next week. We will have a really good think about it once we've we've had confirmed the um, the cause of the discoloration and what needs to be done to fix it. Um, we will have a really good think within the council on, on what our obligations are and what we need to do. Um, so yes, that would be my response to that. Let's talk about this in a week or so's time. Thanks for that, Jane. Um, I think uh, unless some of the other staff want to jump in cor and correct me, um, most of the questions that have come in now have been answered. Um, if you have got any burning questions for any of our attendees, please jump onto Slido now and ask those as quickly as possible. I'll just quickly just, check in with that. Just make one comment. So there's a... Um there's a comment that thank you for confirming there will be no smell unless you have equipment failure. Um, we're not saying there'll be no smell from the plant. Uh, it's never been um, no smell from the plant. Uh, what, what we are looking to achieve, though, is removing that foul odour from the reduced sulphur compounds. So um, we may still get uh, the sewage odours that are commonly associated with the plant from time to time uh, and they do um, plague some of the local neighbourhood in in very still weather conditions uh, but we we're, what we're wanting to eliminate are those reduced sulphur compounds and those odours that are overwhelming even at very low uh, concentrations. Uh, 
Right, we just did have a few more questions coming in there. Thanks everyone. Um, can council provide any advice to homeowners with, I think it's paint damage, not paint damage, um, as this continues to worsen over time? Nigel, are you able to answer that one? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> as Jane said before, we're expecting a full report from our um, consultant at ne next week and we'll be having discussions then. In the meantime, we have, and we said this at the um, last Brighton meeting as well, we're, we're suggesting that people don't um, don't do anything else with their house. We, do not, we wouldn't want to see people, for instance, water blasting, um, loose paint off or things like that. So we're just asking that people just wait in the uh, in the interim and we'll be coming back to them fairly shortly on that. Thanks. All right, I think again, unless any of the staff want to jump in, apologies, we're sort of swapping between our two bits of technology to make sure we're getting all of your questions answered. Um, if any more do come in, of course, we do have that option to reply to you over the coming days uh, in writing. Uh, and if that is the case, we will make sure that we do that. So we have now reached the end of our presentation. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us um, for this webinar tonight. If you have any feedback about the session itself, please contact our engagement team. If we go to the next slide, we should have some information there for you. Yep, so, um, uh, so any feedback or questions about the webinar, you can go to wastewater at ccc.govt.nz. If you have feedback about um, how we've run the session or, or any, any um, information for us along those lines, you can go to engagement at ccc.govt.nz. We do welcome your feedback. Um, contact the team with your queries. Um, you, we will be in touch over the coming days uh, with answers to your questions, links to watch this session um, and the slides uh, for you to share if you wish to. Thanks again from myself to all of the staff who have presented tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Po Marie.